Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Masters of Marketing. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking, speaking with Chris Lukey, who's uh, part of Pubcast Worldwide and Manufacturing Happy Hour. Chris, it's great to have you today. Ross, Brian, thanks so much for giving me the opportunity to join you and your community today. Looking forward to talking about leveraging niche podcasts to grow your business. Looking forward to hearing your presentation awesome. and having a witty banter after. I'm a huge right. podcast fan, Chris. I'm, I'm super excited to see what you got in the podcast world going on. Cool. Well, I'm excited to share a few stories from my experiences doing two shows. Well, uh, if I can use this as an opportunity just to dive into the first slide, um, like you guys said, I'm the host of two different shows. Uh, both have been running for about three years, uh, both, and both of them have a beer-oriented kick to them. So a, a little <laughs> bit about me. My name's Chris Lukey. I am, as my day job, I'm an account manager uh, for a large industrial automation company in the manufacturing industry. And that ties into the story I'm going to tell you today around one of my podcasts, Manufacturing Happy Hour. So um, I run two shows, Manufacturing Happy Hour being one that is focused around trends and technologies in the manufacturing sector. Um, and typically I'm grabbing a beer with my guests as we have our conversations just to make the discussions a little more approachable and casual. Um, and then in addition to that, I host another show called Pubcast Worldwide where it's more of an entertainment show where I explore craft beer culture around the world. Um, but nevertheless, this has given me three years of experience in the podcasting space, both not only for fun, but I think more importantly for today's topic in terms of how it impacts things from a business standpoint. Like I mentioned, I'm an account manager. So one of my main jobs is to sell um, equipment at the end of the day. And these are tools that allow me not only to generate leads, but build long-term relationships with my community. So a lot of today's discussion will be in the context of manufacturing happy hour, um, but it applies to any podcast in a niche industry. So when we think of podcasting, a lot of people typically think of some of the big names out there. You probably recognize Joe Rogan um, in the upper left-hand corner, one of the most downloaded popular podcasts of all time. John Lee Dumas in the upper right from Entrepreneur on Fire. Amy Porterfield down in the center. You know, I think a lot of people get caught up in if I want to have a successful podcast, I need to have tens of thousands or millions of downloads. And the truth is that's not the case, particularly with a niche podcast where your main goal is to attract not the biggest audience in the world, but the right audience. One example I'll give in the context of uh, our current state, um, I'm a big music fan, I'm a big concert goer. So um, right now the current COVID situation, I can't go to many shows, but this is a picture of one of my favorite venues in San Francisco, California, where I live called Slims. And Slims is a 500 person venue. So you can see this is packed for a rock show right now with 500 people, looks like a sold out crowd. And the reality is my show Manufacturing Happy Hour attracts a regular listener base of 500 listeners, which while compared to like a Joe Rogan who's getting millions of downloads, that might seem like a small number. But if you look at this room, you're really, you know, typically it would make sense that I show like an auditorium at a conference, but we're having some fun today. But I'm talking to this number of people every week on my show and I'm talking to the right group of them. They're all interested in manufacturing. Many of them run manufacturing businesses or they have influence in the manufacturing space. So when, if, if you are someone that's thinking of leveraging a podcast to grow your business, try to think of it in the context of, even if I have you know, 100, 200, 50, think about how many people fit in a room like that that you get to talk to and have a long intimate conversation with every week. Um, so this really goes into some of the reasons why you might want to consider starting a podcast for your niche industry. The first is what we were just talking about. It targets the right audience, not necessarily the largest audience in the world. Um, the second thing is it leverages an intimate medium. You know, I've done uh, video series and video content as well, really shorter form video content for the majority of the time I've been running Manufacturing Happy Hour. The podcast itself is really only less than half a year old in this case. But what, what it does is podcasts really get you to build a relationship with your audience because they hear you talking, whether it's you or with, talking with your guests, and they really feel like they know you after, let's say, a 22-minute commute where your podcast has been on the whole time, 
or you know when they're going for a jog the reality is they hear you week after week and start to feel like they have a relationship with you which is something that not every other form of content can do um Second, third, it builds relationships and authority within your industry. Now, the format of manufacturing happy hour is more often than not an interview type of platform. So in my case, I'm able to build connections with executives and leaders in the manufacturing space that I otherwise wouldn't have a reason to talk to. So we talk about using a niche podcast as a way to build your business. It's not necessarily just in terms of leads and opportunities and immediate tangible dollars. A lot of it is that long-term authority building and relationship building that can come in handy a year, two, five years down the line in your career. Chris, has, has anybody ever like, uh, like bumped into you on the street and recognized you or like stopped you and say, hey, you're that guy like based on your voice? <laughs> I, that hasn't happened to me yet, but funny enough, so I mentioned I'm based in San Francisco, and uh, one of my team members was talking to, um, you know, a, a customer we call on that happened, they, they happened to bump into one time, and they're like, hey, you might want to talk to, um, you know, Chris Lukey sometime, and they're like, wait, is that, is that the guy that hosts Manufacturing Happy Hour, and that was, so, you know, like, like I said, I, I'm not like a massive show or anything, but there, you will have some of those serendipitous type of things happen from time to time. Or when I've been at a trade show, I've had a couple people come up and be like, oh, you're the manufacturing happy hour guy. Can I get a picture? Like it doesn't happen often, but it's, it's, I guess there's enough, it's seldom enough that the charm is still there when it happens. Let's put it that way. So you, like, like it goes back to that relationships and authority. Like you become a resource, a recognizable resource in your industry. And this is just manufacturing for anyone that's listening in other industries. I mean, this goes for any type of niche. This, this is just what I have from my experience to talk to so far. Amazing. So, and, and, it, and I, I think that kind of ties in the last point where it uniquely positions you in your space. The reality is there aren't many people doing this in manufacturing. There are some industries, you know, probably like the travel industry, for example, where the podcasting market might be a little more saturated. But, you know, just be, if you are thinking to yourself, gosh, you know, I don't know if a podcast is a fit for my industry. No one does this. That's the perfect reason to start a show because you'll be immediately differentiated from competitors, other peers in the industry, whatever that may be. Um, so next, we're going to go into an example around generating leads. That last slide was really built more around kind of the long term, the mid term, the relationships and the rapport. What I'm going to talk to is a quick story around how uh, manufacturing happy hours help me gain new business. So one thing to do with any podcast, and this is another tie in is after you hit publish on that episode and it gets distributed to iTunes and Spotify, you want to make sure you're doing the right promotion for it as well, because it's a great piece of content that you've created to share on social media, whether that's LinkedIn, Instagram, whichever it may be. Think about what platforms where your audience is. Um, in my case, a lot of the manufacturing industry, the best spot to find them is on LinkedIn since it's a more professional platform. Um, and one day, I was jumping on LinkedIn. I'd been sharing content for you know a few months and um, all of a sudden, I saw a new message pop in. So I'm like, all right, well, what is this? Um, so once it loads, there we go. So I get uh, basically this message verbatim is sitting in my inbox it says, Chris, you know, found you on LinkedIn. I run a 160 person tile manufacturing business in California, and we are in need of helping automate a lot of our manual processes. Would love to know if you would be, you, you could be helpful or know someone who could, I'll send a few videos of some of our needs. And I just want to be honest, this is the type of lead I'd love to get all day long. It's a relevant lead. It's something that comes before a project has gone out to bid. It's really a leader of a company asking me to be a consultant in an early phase of a project discussion, which I, you know, I think we all, we all know that sales cycles are, you know, do you really need to get involved earlier in the sales cycle by the chance some, by the time you're getting like a request for a proposal, chances are you're really too late to influence an opportunity. So the reality of having a podcast and being able to share this type of content on social media is it brings in the ideal type of lead I'd love to get all day long that gets converted to opportunities in my funnel. And then the last topic, um, probably the last big topic before I go into some tips and tricks is you know, you want to go beyond your podcast as well. Creating a niche industry podcast is a great opportunity to build an industry community. 
Um, what you're seeing below is a screenshot from a, what I call a virtual manufacturing happy hour that I've started in the face of COVID-19 and having us all work from home. I'm able to set up a Zoom call, pull together industry leaders um, from my space and have a conversation, a casual conversation. As you can see, everyone's brought a drink to this discussion. We do it in the afternoon. And it really allows me to not only, not only provide a service to my industry, but it, makes the, it, it turns the people that are listening to the show and it turns your audience into a more engaged part of your podcasting ecosystem. So it's no longer just me interviewing a guest every week. I'm able to turn it into events that build a dedicated user community as well. Um, you know, from uh, in my case, I do this on LinkedIn. It's about 150 people strong. But these are people that, you know, when you share content on a social platform, you don't necessarily have as much control of the conversation. But in this case, when I'm sharing content, the industry community, I'm able to encourage the right discussions in this group that can be relevant to my business, relevant to my industry. It's uh, what I would use this as a way to describe. It's a great opportunity to really think about what is most interesting to your audience. It allows me to ask them questions and say, hey, what do you hear on the show? What do you want it to feature? So it allows me to get more ideas for content and build up a show that will continue to grow beyond the 500 regular listeners that it has today. So hopefully, you know, as if you're thinking about starting a show, don't just think of it in terms of a podcast, but think of it as a social media platform. Think of it as a community platform where you can really pull in your type of ideal customers and have better conversations with them on a regular basis. So, so Chris, going back to that, it shows that the community, it looks like a, a LinkedIn group. Yep. Right? So there's a lot of kind of like conversation around um, community manager. Like we have a Facebook community. Mm -hmm. um, you, there's, there's Slack. There's, mm -hmm. uh, there's like all kinds of different tools. There's, um, you know, Twitch, like LinkedIn groups. How did you land on a LinkedIn group? Yeah, great, great question. I, I think it goes back to really just social media strategy in general. In, in the case of Manufacturing Happy Hour, my audience really lives on LinkedIn. You know, there are different ways I could go. I, you know, for example, a Facebook group. And I think this is an opportunity to differentiate the importance of having a page for your um, community, whether that's on Facebook or LinkedIn, and having a group. Because a group, it's really where you want everyone discussing content. You want people bringing up relevant content to your industry versus a page is where you're sharing new episodes, you're basically, you know, you're curating content, you're providing updates, but it's really not where the conversations happen that can drive new opportunities forward. It's the important, it's kind of like you want to empower your ecosystem. Um, and for me to answer your question, it goes back to LinkedIn. I chose it because that's where my audience already was hanging out. I was connecting with most people in my industry on LinkedIn. So I said, you know, yeah, maybe there are advantages to a Facebook group. Maybe there are advantages to Slack or Twitch, but in terms of the ease of getting a listener into a community group, LinkedIn for me was where it was going to be easier. So I would just encourage people to think about what, what for their industry, their niche makes sense in that case. Uh, so LinkedIn is um, doing the LinkedIn live now and I see it like, like blasting all over my LinkedIn feed. Have you, have you considered that? Or are you in that application process? Yeah, so that's that's on my list right now. I, I I would love to say that I've already done it. I and and one one thing I've been telling people right now is speed is the name of the game in the current environment we're in. Like the quicker you can execute on an idea, the better. Um, it would you know I, I look at that as probably an area that I could have jumped on a little quicker in that yeah. regard because I'm already at the point where I'm getting hit with it all the time. Where I'm like, wow, there's a lot of LinkedIn Live. I'm all it's almost oversaturating already. You know, what I will say is I made a couple decisions and trade-offs by not doubling down on that right away because I doubled down on doing virtual events. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. think for me, that's, that's paid off. I mean, there's, I mean, you can always look back and be like, oh, should I have done LinkedIn Live and st instead of starting virtual events? And, you know, you're never going to be able to look back totally and be like, well, it could have been different this way. But I've been happy with the success that I've had on um, doing virtual events so far. And I think rather than being distracted, trying to do too many things, being consistent with that has really paid off. Awesome. So this is actually really the last slide that I have before we get into more of a conversation and open up opportunities for other discussions. So I just wanted to leave you with some tips to think about if you're thinking of starting a niche podcast. The first is I always tell people, don't let equipment stop you. The reality is 
it's pretty cheap to start a podcast in this day and age. Um, I just put this in the upper right hand corner so you can kind of see it's, it's the, actually the um, newer version of the microphone I'm using today as I'm going through this conversation. It's a USB and XLR microphone it costs like, I think it's like a hundred bucks, but you know, it's, you really don't need much more than just investing in an initial microphone to get started. There's a lot of free software. There's a lot of cheap software that allows you to record remotely and produce. So, you know, I, I say this with video or anything, don't let equipment be an excuse for not getting started because you probably have most of what you need to get started today. Um, the second thing is I, I always, I do like to consider podcasting something that should be invested in. Um, at the very least, you should be investing time to creating a good show. There are platforms that will, platforms and courses that will help you launch, help you become a better interviewer. The one thing I see a lot of podcasters do in terms of making a mistake is they think anyone can start interviewing. And the reality is anyone can start interviewing, but Look at it as any other skill. The more you do it, the more you practice, the better you get. So don't just brush it off as, hey, you know, I've got the microphone now. You know, I'm, you know, I'm already the perfect podcaster. You're probably, all, you're, you probably have a lot of strengths that you can bring to the table right off the bat. But just consider like any skill, you want to hone your craft and you want to keep learning and leveraging best practices that people have used in the past. And, you know, as we get into the ask me anything part of this, I'm happy to, to dive further into some of that. Um. Another thing is make sure you're providing advice and entertainment. Um, I think what I've seen with a lot of niche podcasts in, you know, I'll, I'll talk to my industry, the manufacturing industry, it ends up being very dry and very technical. And it's important to make sure the advice you're providing is tactical because people want a reason to show up, particularly with a niche show, but also make sure you're providing some fun to it as well that keep people coming back. If you have a lot of great advice, but it's presented in a boring fashion, you're going to lose your audience really quickly. So try to create ways that make it fun. When I, whenever I bring a guest on the show, since uh, my industry has a tendency to be overly technical or be unnecessarily verbose with our descriptions, my first question is, is always, you know what describe what you do in the context of if we're having a beer at a bar right now just to keep it casual and also get a story out of them so advice and entertainment is my suggestion and then finally i mentioned it before but you know brian back to your uh comment about leveraging linkedin live you know the real reason that i i haven't put the time towards it yet is i've been focused on staying consistent with my podcast and staying consistent with the virtual events that i've been hosting for my audience so it's one thing to start a show but make sure you're being consistent with it as well um that you know if if, it, if that's every other week every week you know multiple times a week once a month you know there start gauging your audience the reality is once you get started your audience will probably start telling you how often they want to hear from you and you can adjust accordingly but when you start, try to be consistent and uh, roll from there. So that is what I had in terms of my presentation today. Um, I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation for this after this. And then also, if uh, you want to find me, uh, look for me on LinkedIn. I think I'm the one of the only Chris Lukies on there right now. Um, so would love to keep this discussion going now and in the future. Chris, this was a great presentation. Quick, to the point, lots of actionable advice. Having just started this ourselves, I'm looking at a lot of this going, man, I should take Chris's advice. Like, <laughs> uh, just being consistent is probably the number one. So my question for you is when you're getting started and you want to build a reputation for yourself, we started doing this every day so that we could quickly interview a lot of people, mm -hmm. have them on the show and build that reputation. But we've kind of found that every day is almost too much. Sure. How do you, how do you build a reputation for yourself when you're only doing it once a week and you want to go out and say, Hey, big shot. You want to be on my podcast? I've had three people so far. Sure. So good question. Um, a couple things I would say, I think part of it is just because you're doing in, in my case, I'm typically a once a week type show right now. I'm actually doing more content cause I've got more bandwidth for it. I've mixed in a mini series, um, that I'm being consistent with as well. So it's a twice a week show for the current month. Um, but the reality is, even if the show's just once a week, there are a lot of activities you should be doing outside of that, that 
you know, keep you front of mind with your customers. So in my case, I, you know, if I record an episode, I have a newsletter that I send to my customers as well, which is another way. It's like, okay, I have the content. Now I need to make time to make sure I'm spreading that piece of content because just, just because you put that piece of content on iTunes, on Spotify, it doesn't mean people are going to find it. You need to be spending those other, you know, in the case of a weekly show, those other four working days or, you know, six days, if you're working weekends and you're really putting the pedal of the metal, um, you want to spend that time getting it out there in emails to your customers. You want to be doing it on social media, getting it out there and continue to build that audience up right now. And then in terms of leveraging, you know, like you said, if you're trying to get someone on, it's like, oh, well, we've only had three guests so far. What I would say is if you're in a niche, leverage your past experiences as well. It doesn't just need to be, oh, I just started this podcast. I've only had three guests. It could be, hey, I've worked in the manufacturing industry for 10 years, helping, you know, equipment manufacturers get to market quicker, helping end users, you know, reduce their scrap. There are a lot of other things that play into your reputation besides your podcast. Your podcast might be new, but that doesn't mean your experience in the industry isn't new. So that would be my advice would be to leverage other relevant experience to your space to getting new guests. That's a lot of great advice for how to get people on. Um, when you said that you should set, spend time outside of your podcast distributing it, can mm -hmm. you give an idea of just uh, the average, what it takes to start, record, and distribute? Like how much time you spend researching the person, actually filming, maybe editing, and how much time you spend getting every episode out? Wow, great question. And uh, so I'll, I'll give my workflow for this. But for this, I do want to say there are ways to outsource a lot of these things as well. You can't outsource your preparation per se, but you can, you know, as you get more and more into podcasting, you can outsource production, for example. So, you know, in, in my mind, I think preparation is one of the biggest keys. I would spend you know, try to spend an hour preparing for a podcast. Look at, you know, if, and this is an interview podcast. I'm going to talk in the context of an interview podcast. Like, look at the person you're interviewing, look at their LinkedIn profile, research what you can about them in advance to come up with meaningful questions. This goes back to creating a show that's not just tactical and informative, but one that's entertaining as well. Um, because to host a good interview, you want to know something about the guest and you want to be asking them questions that people aren't necessarily going to be able to find on the internet. You want to get into their why. Why do they do what they do? What did they think in this scenario when they were faced with a challenging situation at their company? You want to dig into stories and the real passion behind what why that person does what they do. So I know that was a little bit of a deviation, but I'd say an hour for preparation. I just take notes in a LinkedIn file and then kind of, or not a LinkedIn file, a Evernote file and just get that sorted out. Um, our, the, present, the interview itself usually takes an hour. Um, and then production, you know, I'm a little slow at this. I'm like three hours if I'm producing my own episode because I want to listen through and I want to, you know, take out some of the ums and the audio issues. And then um, from there, uh, create a nice intro outro. Another thing that I tell people is set the expectations of what your episode is about in like a short introduction. Like if you do, if you're, if you've done a 45 minute interview, great, but you might want to tell your audience, Hey, here are three things you can expect from today's show. So that way an audience member could be like, Oh, I really want to learn about this today. I really need to listen to this whole episode because I really want to get to that third nugget or and this isn't a bad thing. One of your audience members might be, you know what? This episode doesn't sound like it's for me. And they can, skip, they can just skip ahead to the next episode. That's not a bad thing because you've just saved that person time. You've showed a respect for that person's time. So, you know, if we're adding this up, it takes about five hours to go from prep to record to produced. Um, and then, you know, it's, and after that promotion, I mean, you can spend a couple hours on promotion for an episode, but I wouldn't think of it as an extra task for anyone that's building a brand or a business. They should be on social media. They should be doing a newsletter as it is. This is just another tool that you're mixing into this process. But for, let's say, new activities, additive activities that weren't part of your workflow before, you're probably looking at five extra hours an episode. But like I said, I'm probably a little extreme in the production. You can shorten that down to you know three or four maybe. Gotcha. That That's interesting because we're doing the exact opposite. So okay. what, what would you, I mean, so for like your presentation today, I did not research you for an hour. I came yeah. here to see a short presentation, to learn from you, to ask you questions that you didn't know I was going to ask you. Yep. Maybe you've answered these before, but we're trying to give a little nugget of information on all these different growth tactics to people. Do you kind, would you recommend 
or have you seen in the past? And from that, would you recommend this sort of approach or your podcast sort of approach? And do you see things that will fall apart with the approach we're using? No, I think, I think um, you guys have a good approach. I would consider this a little different than a podcast. Also a podcast, you're really, you know, you kind you're looking at that person and you, you, cause you, what, what you guys have done, you've kind of done the same thing I do in my intros. You've set the expectation about what today's presentation is going to be about. And this is different where it's not a, a dialogue per se, like a podcast is you've set me up to be a presenter for this conversation. So, you know, you, you did the, you, you, I, I you know, and just like kind of getting meta on this, you did great research in advance. You're like, Hey, send us this information. So we know who you are. We know how to connect with you on LinkedIn, all that. And then we just want to make sure we have a honed in topic so we can set expectations with your audience. So I, in some, I think you did a lot of the, the preparation you need for this. It's just different formats um, in what we're doing. I think with a dialogue, it's important because, researching is crucial because if you're getting that person on your podcast, particularly if they're, you know, an executive or someone that doesn't have a lot of limited time, you want, one thing that helps you build your rep, your rep, reputation and build your rapport is asking questions that they don't always get. Yeah. I've totally seen that. Like you sit in with a CEO and everyone's like, what's it like to be CEO? Just raise your hand. You're like, do you keep a journal? And they're like, what? Yeah. Nobody's ever yeah. asked me that before. <laughs> exactly. Um, so now that we've created all this awesome content, you said that it's a great way to keep in touch with the people that you interview and your audience. How do you keep in touch with the people that you interview to make sure that maybe they want to come back on your podcast or even if they're not coming back, you know, you, you push them new podcasts and just keep a conversation going? Yeah, good question. So keeping in contact with the folks you've interviewed, I think part of that is staying consistent with your content because uh, you know, and I should take a step back. I'm connected with them on LinkedIn and social media platforms. They're on my email list. So they're part of some of my default communications, I would say for an example. So they're still seeing me put out the content. So they're like, oh, wow, you know, Chris started this podcast. It goes back to your comment earlier when you've only had three guests. Maybe they were one of the earlier guests, but they're, they're seeing it grow and grow. It's like, wow, I'm really glad I got to be on the front end of that. And then I think a great way, let's say you want to leverage them to come back on is say you've been consistent with your podcast and your audience starts giving you feedback. They're like, wow, I'd really like to get some advice on, on uh, leading through uncertainty. That's a big topic right now because we're in the middle of a very uncertain situation. You could reach out to one of your old guests and say, hey, so-and-so, I really appreciated being, you being on my show six months ago. I've been getting some feedback that people want to hear about wartime leadership leading through uncertainty. I think you'd be great for that. Would you want to jump back on the show? And more often than not, if you've done a good job the first time around and you, you know, I, even that alone, and you bring that type of communication to them saying, hey, I think you're the right person to cover this topic and my audience wants to hear you discuss it, they're going to be very willing to jump on if you've given them that type of personal contact in that capacity. That's a good so, response. So about the uh, manufacturing happy hour, um, if you were to move industries per se, and you had like an incredible opportunity to move to a separate industry, would do you think you would keep going with your podcast? Gosh, that is an interesting question. That's a great question. I have not actually thought about that a ton before. Um, let me, let me think about this. My gut reaction to that question is right. maybe there's a way to pivot. I'm sorry, what were you going to say? So, so here, here, let's give you, give you the, uh, like while you're thinking about that in the background, here's a layup. Um, what's your favorite podcast? What's my favorite podcast? Yeah. So there is, um, I, I, I'll, I'll give you two. Um, Jordan Harbinger is the host of the Jordan Harbinger show. He interviews some of the best of the best in the world. He's had like, he, he had Kobe Bryant on the show back in the day. He had, um, he's had world renowned chefs. Um, just trying to think any top performer he's had uh, Chris Voss, the guy that wrote um, never split the difference. Um, and like he, he's the type of guy that prepares for 10 hours before he does an interview. Um, and Prepares he does a really good job of getting into someone's why. Um, and by the way, when I say preparation also, that can be listening to a podcast that that guest has been on. That can be reading a book that guest has done. So I think he lumps those in, but he is just someone when I want to learn from someone that's like asking really good, insightful questions, he's at the top of my list. Um, and then Noah Kagan uh, ran, I, I don't know if he's still doing it, but he ran the Noah Kagan show for a while and his interviews were always 20 minutes long. And he was really good at the, here are three things you can expect from this episode at the start. I always knew what I was going to get. And I always knew it was going to be quick and actionable. 
And I just loved the way he respected his audience's time in that regard. AppSumo guy, right? AppSumo. Yep. That's the one. Yeah. yeah. He, he's got, he's got a ball of energy. He's like, he does. He yeah. does. Yeah. He's a, uh, he was made for podcasting. I thought he, uh, I was glad I was really happy to when I saw him start the show. Cause I'd heard him on other podcasts before up to that point. I always thought he brought really good actionable advice just being on those shows. It's amazing. I do have an answer to your question before this though. Okay, good. So if I were to pivot like to a completely new space, I would probably do a final season of a podcast if I was getting it, go, getting away from it to kind of close it out, at least for the time being, because you never know how you're going to switch into, you know, where, where your career is going to take you. I'm 33, so I've barely started my career, all things considered in the grand scheme of things. Um, so I might do something like that rather than just like abruptly stop. I think that's a good, and that's a way to bring closure to anything you do. Just kind of like, hey, this is the final season. This is the final six episodes of this right now. And people are going to, you know, it's a good opportunity to say, hey, I'm going to do this next. Maybe you want to start a podcast in that niche. Because back to one of the previous points, it would be a lot easier for me to start a podcast in a new industry, having done this a couple of times and being like, hey, I'm new to the industry, but I've been podcasting for three years. All of a sudden I have my tool for getting new guests on the show at that point if I wanted to start a new show because I feel like this will be something I'll be doing regardless of where my career takes me for a while. Yeah, it's amazing. I think once we started this show, um, the, the amount of just kind of like ephemeral or just kind of like synchronicity type of events that have occurred just, just in the last two, three months have been amazing. Um, I think uh, the, the one thing that I, we found is if you, the, which we, we actually called the interview hack, mm -hmm. um, which is interviewing somebody in your industry to get them to start a relationship with like on the podcast is like the number one thing that we found. Um, like that's been an amazing treat an amazing like synchronous way to like start conversations and start relationships with, with people that we respect and, and like, including like yourself in, in the industry mm -hmm. of, of marketing and podcasting. So this has been an amazing show. This is cool. Yeah, I, I, you know, one of the first things that stuck out when I was doing my, because I try to, if I'm going on a show, I try to research, you know, as well. And I, I just saw the, the consistency jumped out. I looked at the Facebook group. I'm like, all right, these guys are executing on a regular basis. I'm in. Like, it didn't, it doesn't take much more than that to see if someone's taking it seriously and someone's putting in the genuine effort and it shows. And I feel like consistency is one of the biggest ways it shows. Um, it's, you'll, you'll get people that are, more willing to jump on when they see that effort already there. All right. So let's see, stay consistent to get your media game up to, to provide your audience, audience consistent value on a, on a day to day, week to week, month to month basis. Mm -hmm. um, use the interview hack to, to kind of get the most important people in your industry onto your show. Uh, equipment is not too expensive. You can get started pretty, pretty inexpensively. You got Squadcast, you got Zoom, you got a bunch of tools out there these days. Mm -hmm. um, we got a, a nice little section that we talked about on how to get new guests. And uh, is there anything else that, that kind of like burning desire of like something else in the podcast space? Brian, I think that was a great summary. You know, I, I, at this, the, the only other thing I'd reiterate is if you're putting out a show, make sure that it's something people are going to want to come back to as well. I, I, I see so many good potential podcasts get killed because they just, they try to be too corporate. They try to be too tactical that they forget that it needs to be something that people are going to enjoy listening to on a regular basis. They want to know the hosts. They want to know the guests. So make sure to create that as part of the overall podcast experience. Makes sense. Makes a ton of sense. So this With has that, been great. This has I been appreciate an awesome all the episodes. What's that? For sure. With that, this has been an awesome episode and to stay consistent, we're going to close it out, keep it short. I'm going to go grab a drink. I don't know about you. <laughs> <laughs> if it weren't, uh, I'll probably refill my coffee, but I will be cracking a beer later in the day. That's for sure. <laughs> it's, nice. It's, cheers, gentlemen. Awesome. Thanks a bunch. Cheers, Chris. Thanks so much. And thank you to everyone who's listening on Masters of Marketing. See you tomorrow. Later.